Welcome everybody um, to this first session of Open Access Week. Uh, my name is Ginny Barber. I'm the Director of Open Access Australasia. Um, I'm just here to do the beginning and just remind you about the logistics for these sessions. So as usual, if you could make sure you're muted throughout and keep your camera off, um, type your questions into the chat. We are recording this and we will aim to finish on time. Um, and with that, I'm delighted to hand over to Kim Tyree, the Chair of the Open Access Australasia Executive Committee to chair this first session. Uh, tina koto, tina koto, tina tato katoa, ko Kim Tyree toku ingoa, he waikato oku tipuna, he kaito ha poka ahu ki te wanana aranui o tamaki makoto. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, as Jenny said, I'm Kim Tairi. I'm the university librarian here at AUT in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and chair of Open Access Australasia Executive. I would like to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of the land from which you are joining us today, their elders past, present and future who have an enduring connection to the land and never ceded their sovereignty. Namihi Nui, thank you for joining us today. Uh, as you know, the theme for Open Access Wiki this year is climate justice. Clearly one of the most pressing matters for researchers, teachers and communities. Climate justice is a broad concept in that it sees environmental and climate challenges about being more than just science and economics. Climate justice is about social justice and human rights. Climate change and environmental harm affect everyone, but some people will be more affected than others. A central question and where openness can play a part is how do we ensure the voices of those most affected can be heard? We have a Rawe or awesome week of sessions ahead that will focus on different aspects of climate justice from citizen science to climate journalism to creating a resource for climate justice teachers. So the link to those sessions so you can sign up uh, will be shared uh, a bit later and in the chat. Finally, before we introduce our incredible panel today, our thanks go to the organizing team, an enthusiastic and committed group of people who have given up their time willingly to develop a wonderful program with a stellar lineup of speakers and panelists. A big namahi nui, Thank you, as always, to Ginny and Sandra from uh, the OAA for their incredible support and guidance. And now for our first session, which will be, as Ginny said earlier, recorded and available on the OAA website for you to revisit and share. And please post questions into the chat and we'll try to get to them. Uh, all. If you are tweeting, use the hashtags OA Week and uh, or uh, Open for Climate Justice. It is my honour and privilege to welcome you to this session. No mai, haere mai, warm Pacific greetings. It has been said that climate change is the biggest threat in the Pacific Islands today. The panel are all actively involved in researching the impact of climate change in the Pacific Islands and are all part of the Pacific Ocean Climate Crisis Assessment Team, uh, a joint multidisciplinary research project between University of Canterbury and the University of the South Pacific. Each of the panelists will speak for 10 minutes. Uh, their korero or talks will explore the role that open access plays in facilitating dialogue uh, in affected communities to ensure research is accessible and reaching those who need it to help fight climate injustice. Then uh, we'll have time for some questions and we've got some prepared questions to throw in there as well. Uh, so there'll be the opportunity for you to uh, interact with the panel. 
So let me introduce our incredible panel of researchers to you. We have Dr. Morgan Wairio, uh, Pro Chancellor and Chair of Solomon Islands National University Council. Hopefully we'll be joined by uh, Tina Lalaai Tulsa of the Macmillan Brown Center for Pacific Studies. She's flying back from Samoa today, so we're not quite sure if she'll make it, but she will try. We also have Dr. Suli Bunibola uh, of the Macmillan Brown Center for Pacific Studies and uh, Dr. Delayla uh, Garboi, also of the Macmillan Brown Center for Pacific Studies. Welcome everybody. Our first speaker for today is Morgan, and I'll hand over to you. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and welcome everyone who are joining us from right across the Pacific or the globe today for this session. Uh, let me first uh, thank the organizers of this uh, program uh, for inviting me to join and participate in this particular session, which is on climate justice and open access Australasia. You've done a marvelous job in ensuring that uh, we participate in this particular uh, session. Uh, you know, the reason why I accepted to participate in this uh, session is because I see the real value and, uh, and the benefit in contributing uh, the current knowledge as well as the experience uh, to share with you on a very important topic uh, this afternoon. So that's the very reason why I, I, particip I, I willingly participate in this session and thank you the organizers for this marvelous job in getting everybody together to come and uh, interact as well as yeah, experiences and ideas. Uh, on this particular topic. Now, as everyone probably know already, um, the Pacific region is at the forefront of the climate change impact. And uh, that is common knowledge. Everybody is living that experience. They, they've experienced many of those hazards and the impacts that they cause on their own communities, households, right across the Pacific Islands. You know, we are quite small islands with very fragile ecosystems, both terrestrial and human systems. And we continue to experience the impact of climate change on our everyday living. And uh, I'm saying this with confidence as well, because I've been involved in both the research on climate change impact in the Pacific region, as well as uh, involved as an author in the in the governmental panel on climate change, IPCC, global assessment reports. And uh, the science uh, on climate change is very clear. There is very high confidence that climate change is happening and its uh, impact are causing uh, problems for communities, both terrestrial and human systems. And especially so for the Pacific Islands. And that's where the, uh, the elements of climate injustice or climate justice comes in. Because we, are, we already know that for the Pacific Islands, their contribution to this whole climate change uh, effect is quite very minimal. And yet they are facing the brunt of the impact of climate change. Uh, so that, you know, that's, that's where we are talking about justice. So where is the justice for the people in the Pacific? when they contribute very little to this phenomena that is impacting the global community. And yet they are at the forefront of the impact. You know, when you look at the impact assessments that have been done globally, the Pacific Islands region are the most vulnerable and the most highly impacted uh, in terms of the climate change impact. And if we are forecasting into the future, when you look at the risk and projected impacts into the future, uh, Pacific Islands will, will continue to be impacted. Actually, when you look at the risks to Pacific Islands, the major overarching risk to Pacific Island communities are the, the issue with habitability of the islands. 
So we are already facing issues with food security, water insecurity, uh, diseases that are caused by changing climate. And therefore, habitability of these islands is at risk, even well before the disappearing of the islands. So that's an issue that is, when you look at the justice uh, lens, that's a total injustice to the Pacific Islands when they can be lethal to this uh, phenomena, and yet they are the forefront of the impacts. So that's where uh, I think this important uh, session and uh, all that is happening within this space is very important. We need to bring uh, the voices and the experience of the Pacific people to the global forum. And there are platforms to do that. One, of course, is the IPCC, but that IPCC itself, it's, it's, a, it's a club on its own. You know, they, they document the science of climate change, but they rely very much on the published uh, information from published literature. And therefore they are not capturing what is happening at the ground level with the experiences from the Pacific Islanders. And it's very important that we bring the voices of the Pacific Islanders, the experience into this uh, global assessment process because the global assessments that are conducted by IPCC are the ones that inform key policy makers, you know, global leaders. They made decisions in terms of how do they address climate change using the information that is contained in the IPCC global assessment reports. Now, with the absence of the voices and what is happening in the experience of the Pacific Islanders, they may not be getting the right information that is required to make those informed uh, decisions as well as pol relevant policies. That's why this space that we are now interacting in is very important. We need to provide that space and the platform for Pacific Islanders to bring their voices and their experiences to the global forum so that everybody is well aware of what's happening. Uh, we are experiencing the problems here, but we need to tell the global community about uh, the problems that we experience with uh, impact from climate change, which we didn't cause in the first place. So my involvement with IPCC, I've been involved in the 1.5 special report and uh, the recent uh, six assessment report uh, that's just been released. And what I found was there's been a lot of uh, information about the Pacific that is missing in these global assessments. And that's the reason why I was very instrumental in, in making sure that we bring, you know, whatever great literature or reports or just uh, research into experiences of the people of the Pacific uh, into some sort of a published material that, I, that can inform the IPCC process. And so we, we are thankful to the New Zealand government to fund this particular project, the Pacific uh, and Ocean Climate Crisis Assessment, which my colleagues, Suli and uh, Dalida, who will be, as well as Christina, who will be speaking today, are all involved in. So we are all together, uh, working together in this particular project uh, to canvas all that is happening right across the Pacific, uh, using Pacific authors and writers who are are also experiencing the impacts on the ground so that we can tell the stories of the people in the Pacific, their experiences and what they've been doing in terms of their coping mechanisms and adaptation capability to those you know, impacts that is happening at the village level. So this whole uh, project is all about that. We are documenting what is available in great literature as well as collecting the stories from Pacific Islanders, those from the communities, so that we can put them together in the published material that can inform the IPCC process, but at the same time also inform our leaders, because our leaders also take part in uh, global negotiations, and they, are, they need to be well informed about uh, information and data that is available from the Pacific, so that they can have the, the, the right information to, to make informed decisions and negotiate uh, effectively at global level. So it's twofold for this particular project we are working on. One is to inform those global assessments under the IPCC, but at the same time also inform our leaders so that they can be effectively 
negotiators and at the same time develop uh, you know, practical, pragmatic policies that can, will address climate change impacts on the ground. But at the same time, it's also uh, informed our own very own people in our future generation so that they can be encouraged to continue to put together work that they are doing on the ground to inform uh, key policy decisions within the country. And although now I'm involved in the IPCC work, but I'm, I'm actually also residing on the ground in the village right here on Malaita in Solomon Islands and working with people directly uh, affected, especially some of our people living on the coast. Uh, I'm just right next door to the Langa Langa Lagoon who are actually sitting on and living on artificial islands and they face these issues uh, every day, water security, food security, it's an everyday experience. And the, the sea level rise is also increasing and they are running out of uh, corals to build, to continue to build their islands. These are artificial islands built out of corals. So it, it's a dilemma that they live with every day. And uh, this, this is a sort of news messages and experiences that we need to package and share in this open access so that uh, this platform provides uh, the space for these uh, people living at the age to, to tell the global community about you know, the experiences that they face every day. So uh, whilst I'm working and involved and engaged in the IPCC work on the global science, I'm also working with the communities to ensure that their voices are heard at the same time their experiences are told so that uh, it informs both global communities, leaders, and uh, the next generation that they are, they are building on the ground. So uh, with that, I think I've covered most, most of what I wanted to share during this space, but I'm open to questions after that. And I hope uh, the, our audience uh, have got what uh, the message, the key message that I want to share during this uh, session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Morgan. What we might do is keep the questions until after all the speakers have spoken, and then we can uh, open them up to uh, the whole panel. So uh, next up we have uh, Sully. Thank you very much. Um, sharing my screen. Able to see my screen at the moment? Okay, uh, kia ora koutou katoa, Nisa Mbulabinaka. Um, thank you so much for involving me in this session. Um, though I didn't have a lot of time to prepare, but I managed to pull something together um, uh, in terms of uh, the presentation uh, today. Um, if you look at the picture, uh, it's came back from, uh, not just, but it came back from Fiji in the last month. Um, doing field work for this particular uh, uh, research project, which is the Pacific Ocean Climate Crisis Assessment uh, project, as uh, uh, well explained by by Morgan. Um, so those two pictures really talked about one the 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 impact the impact of climate um, calamities on this island. That's the result of the uh, category five cyclone, tropical cyclone Yasa in 2020 in one of the remote island <clears throat> in Fiji called Kia. Okay, nothing standing, all houses, infrastructure, even the trees. And then in the same picture, in the same underneath that, that is a fish trap built by their ancestors many, many generations ago but they were not using it. They were uh, resorting to the new modern equipment of fiberglass boats, fishing nets from, uh, from the shops. But in reality, after the, the cyclone, everything destroyed, even the, their boats and fishing gears, what do they resort to? And they started sharing the stories. Oh, I think th these, uh, boulders were built to trap fish during high tide. 
and then during low tide the the fish are trapped inside and and, and that managed to feed them uh, while they are trying their best to recover from the tropic uh, from the uh, from the cyclone well when we talk about knowledge and reciprocity i think it's th the researching is so important as well as people who are connected to these places where we are doing research in the Pacific. A good example is shared by, uh, had, uh, like was said by Morgan, doing research, reaching out to global, but as well as uh, being so connected to, to, to communities because that, that's where um, uh, resilience need to be built. When we talk about knowledge and reciprocity, and when we talk about resilience, it looks good on paper. Because we're talking about resilience from, in many times, resilience had been uh, shared from a very capitalistic understanding. Once you have a lot of money, you are resilient. But for these specific communities, small islands, money is not a need. There's no supermarket or no shops where you can use your money. You can have a thousand dollars in your wallet, but nowhere to spend it. Is it a need? Nah. So redefining knowledge and redefining resilience in this context is so important. And that's why researching uh, for these particular communities and how knowledge is so important for them is in the sense of survival. It builds knowledge to them is for their survival. But in terms of reciprocity, we as researchers going in there, uh, uh, learning and living with them, but contributing to global knowledge and awareness. But how do we, 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 we let them also benefit from the knowledge that we, we, we are using or from the knowledge that we are analyzing during research? And I think that points to um, um, the critical factor of the project that we are engaged in, Pacific Ocean Climate Crisis Assessment. Um, it aims to provide a comprehensive interdisciplinary multi-methodological integrated assessment for 16 countries in the, in the Pacific region. And most importantly to me, it is the voice uh, you know, of Pacific indigenous knowledge systems and how that can work in harmony with the Western scientific approaches. So th th that is the, the, um, the simple description of, of the project that we are engaged in. And something is important as well as, is that majority, more like 90% of the people, of scholars, authors, researchers involved in the project are from the Pacific. That means most of us lived through and experience living through these climate catastrophes. And we are writing from that perspective. For example, I came to New Zealand in 2016. That means all my life I've lived in the Pacific and especially in Fiji. And I lived through a lot of climate catastrophes. When roofing irons are flying around during tropical cyclone trees, and then you are hiding under you know, house without any roof, without any wall standing. You're writing from that perspective. Um, many people can call it like more like romanticizing what you're writing, but it's, a, it's writing with, with a lot of um, connection to what you are writing. And it's not just painting a picture of a picture that you saw on, on the internet. It's, it's writing those living experience. And most of those, point back to Pacific, uh, to indigenous knowledge systems. And most of us, that's where our resets are based as well. So for instance, um, when we look at knowledge and here at university, we are trying to share knowledge back to these communities. For them, um, in most situations at the district level, at the village level, children are going to schools from five years old. I am the product of one of those. I have to leave my village and you know, stay in a dormitory or hostel to attend school because schools are far, far away from the village. 
and then um, you finish schooling at 19 years old. So all your life, you've been living in schools and knowledge. And whose knowledge you've been learning? It's not their own knowledge. It's not the knowledge that they're going to go back to these communities and build resilience. It's the knowledge to get a job. It's the formal Western knowledge sciences that allow people to go and get a job like all of us. But in reality, in many of these Pacific Island countries, 80% of them will not go through. 80% of them are um, uh, known as failures from formal schooling. They go back to their village. Can they use some of those knowledge? Yes. Can they use majority of those knowledge to build resilience? No. So what, uh, when, when we talk about knowledge and knowledge as a commodity, because they have to go to school to get a job, a formal job, but most of them will have to go back to the village. So when we start doing research for these particular communities, it's so amazing to, to, to realize how their worldviews have been neoliberalized in the sense that they are starting to look at their old ways of knowing the indigenous knowledge systems. They are looking at those knowledge systems, starting to look at those knowledge systems as something old, something outdated. But in the realities of climate catastrophes, like the category five cyclone, they realize the, the fragility of the modern systems that they acquired. This, their boat are fragile, their fiberglass boats are fragile on the rocks during cyclones. Their nets to track fish are taken away during king tides. And what remains are the people, their sense of identity and their connection to the environment. But the education system in their countries don't really value those knowledge systems. So there is a huge role for us as researchers from the Pacific or at the global level, whoever, regardless of whatever race you are, in starting to value and contributing back to these communities in these um, um, so in many of the cases, when you start talking to them and they oh, that means the knowledge systems of our ancestors are so important. That's why you guys who coming from these universities overseas, uh, looking at this as important to us, giving us a sense of confidence that our identity is important. And uh, yeah, but in universities all around, you know, globally, regardless of culture, language, or location, Western knowledge and systems dominate, but, you know, to some cases, be, become the exclusionary measure of all other kind of knowledge, you know, the universal imposition and acceptance, and acceptance rather, of Western knowledge of knowing has pushed to the margin all kind of knowledge. Um, it's more like what uh, uh, the French... Uh, sociologist, Pierre Bourdieu, knowledge is knowledge inequity, uh, iniquity, sorry, in many Commonwealth countries is the product of our shared history, our structures of cultural arbitrary, including colonialism, inequality, etc. So these are some of the things that we face when we do research in these areas. Um, this is a picture of a community uh, where I have been engaging in since 2016 as part of my research when I was doing my PhD and all of my life when I was living there, I'm connected to all many of these communities. And looking at indigenous knowledge in agricultural practices against the commercialization of agriculture because commercialization in agriculture uh, also results in massive deforestation, removal of forests you know, around the village, contributing to many other environmental factors. But to many, many, to many of them, the older generation are familiar with the systems of multi-cropping, the, the, uh, the, the, the examples of uh, using the lunar calendar 
like the Maramataka in New Zealand for Maori communities. The idea of following how shifting cultivation and uh, um, the use of nitrogen fixing plants, which have been used by the ancestors to reinvigorate the land, make it fallow, fallow but plant these crops to, 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 to get in more nitrogen to, um, and then replant it again after a few years. So this knowledge, many of them don't really understand it. Many of them don't really use it, but our older generation know much of it. And I think it's this kind of projects that allowing us as specific scholars to go back to these communities to, to run uh, sessions like Talanoa discussions where elders can start discussing all this knowledge. But most importantly for me is the accent research whereby we do the stuff on the ground. Whatever we learn, make sure that it's imparted and we do it. For example, um, this is uh, about six communities that I'm working with together in Fiji and trying to, to, to get back all these knowledge systems um, in agriculture, especially, uh, and using those knowledge to, to do community-driven projects. And that's allowing uh, food security and resilience um, in many sense. Uh, there's a picture too for the children from two communities. One live near a river, as well as one inland. When they were not able to go to school during COVID-19, we had been running uh, uh, from here, been running some uh, programs, educational programs, but based on indigenous knowledge, get your native trees and totems from the, from the, from the forest, plant them in nurseries near their homes, water it and plant it back, to, uh, back again to, to re, re, rehabilitate uh, creeks and rivers, which had been destroyed by commercial agriculture. Um, seems small, but to to them, to me, for these children, it's something that it will contribute to, to their knowledge, to their worldview, even if they don't make it after 19 years old. And for countries like Fiji, you have to go to school. That's the rule. Otherwise, your parents are going to go to prison. So um, in the project as well, we, we're starting to look at the role of indigenous knowledge and innovation, how that is framed, because resilience, innovations are framed from the very, a very capitalistic understanding, from money, from corporate, but it's not always framed from the marginal community standpoint. So for indigenous knowledge, there are a lot of um, instances, skills, experiences, of indigenous knowledge and how that built into resilience of these communities. Another example is the indigenous knowledge systems of built environment. Uh, I know that there are a few research at the moment now looking at uh, internationally recognized structures for cyclones. How do you build houses which are resilient to tropical cyclones? which are of international standard. Now they begin to realize that most of these internationally recognized standards uh, had been used by villages in the Pacific, uh, scientifically proven. For example, houses need to have those kind of roofs, flexible joints, uh, the walls should be shorter, solid foundation, very less entry points into the house because all those houses got just one, just one door. And, uh, you know, starting to realize that how science are able to complement uh, with indigenous knowledge, that is important and our role in that as well. So where do we go from here? Um, there are a lot of things to be done, but, you know, first step would be to create a more level playing field in academic publishing using large scale open source publishing platforms to you know the restrictions and as, as well as universities in the global south should not be paying you know extra prices to to get access to these uh, 
journals, right? And second, uh, should be a greater focus on interdisciplinary research and teaching so that this will avoid the academic civil wars on the EFTs in universities, and we know that. Uh, recognition given to, to, to achievements of universities and scholars in the global south by thinking beyond the narrow, that knowledge and science is just what is Western kind of definition of knowledge. And we should get out of that box as well. Finally, uh, attempt by universities and academics to, to reevaluate knowledge, which falls beyond the narrow confinement of market imperatives. Knowledge is a commodity, and we know that. But how do we go beyond that as well? Um, lastly, um, you know, many journals do not publish on indigenous knowledge that it is you know, maybe deemed not rigorous enough. Some universities don't even accept the publication assessment of articles published in indigenous scholars journals. Indigenous scholars and those from the global south and minority communities are left, you know, marginalized and voiceless. Um, there are some moves, there are some uh, project, for example, publishing academic journals in our Pacific language. Uh, and um, I've been helping to, to translate one of the academic journals and now it will be published in uh, the Journal of Pacific Research. I think it's at Waikato University so that communities, if we translate that into Fijian or Pacific language, giving it back to them, you know, it's making it more worthwhile rather than giving them uh, uh, papers in English language, even, you know, academic language, nobody wants to read it. So that's all from me and um, yeah. Uh, looking forward to the questions. Thank you. It's fantastic, Sully. It's uh, it's really great to hear about uh, your work in the field and how important it is to take research and turn it into practical things that can be used in villages. Um, and also thank you for calling out the fact that it is a real struggle for Indigenous scholars uh, to get published. Fortunately, across Aotearoa and many of our universities, we have people who, um, who are doing fantastic research and uh, looking for alternative publishing platforms like uh, our Diamond Journals. And it's great to hear about that project uh, in the Waikato. So uh, next up, we have uh, Dalila. Uh, and uh, she's going to share some of her kōrero about her research. Kia ora koutou, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm going to be sharing my presentation that hopefully will appear on the screen in a few seconds. I hope you can all see that. Great. So I'm part of the HOKA project team. So the POCA project is a Pacific Ocean climate risk assessment. Uh, and it's a joint research project between University of Canterbury and uh, University of South Pacific and funded through the New Zealand Ministry uh, Foreign Affairs. So um, the aim of the study is really to look at um, an integrated assessment of 16 countries across the Pacific. And uh, the core of the project is really to uh, give voice to the Pacific indigenous knowledge system. And we're trying to look at that through the scope of Western uh, scientific approaches and see how it could be complementary to each other. So at the Mille Mike Millenbrown Center, so this is the research center that um, I'm part of and um, all the POCA team is part of that center. Um, we have um, um, an approach to the work we're doing through the principle of Toleva. So this is a, someone, a principle that's really helped bridging uh, policy and research uh, by having communities at the core of the work we do. So um, my PhD uh, was on climate relocation and I had a look at land governance in Fiji and I really applied the principle of Telova by trying to understand what communities 
um, we're experimenting and trying to see how theory can inform policy and provide practical options for those communities and see how uh, it could really reflect on uh, a pacific voice. So the approach was really holistic and we tried to connect uh, policy community and um, a, theoretical, a theoretical approach. So this was the core of the work that I've been doing in the few, um, few uh, couple of years. Um, at the Macmillan Brown Center. So I've been looking at uh, case studies in, um, in Fiji, uh, in the Ba province, so the village of Matavalu, um, that has been experimenting a few flooding episodes and was forced to relocate. So the focus was really on trying to capture people's stories on climate mobility and trying to return knowledge back to them. And the way that um, I've been doing that was to trying to understand um, what their preference was in terms of um, returning knowledge back to them. So this was something that I've been uh, approaching from the very beginning of my research. Um, so. I think one really interesting insight from uh, my experience in the field was that um, the, the, the village was actually keen to be involved in any kind of uh, following a publication. And by, by being involved, um, I'm saying that they would like to first know about it. They would like to understand how uh, the research and their um, the stories have been approached. And um, so it was very interesting uh, for me to start with asking them that questions at the very beginning of my research. And so I will maybe maybe try and understand um, uh, from the scope of someone that's experimenting research in the field. So trying to talk for researcher, how this could be beneficial um, at, at, at that level. So. Uh, at, Starting by trying to find adequate uh, methodology uh, is, I think, a first step. So trying to select a community-based particip participatory approach that would be uh, in line with Pacific methodology, such as Talanoa, for example, would support adequate sharing of knowledge at a later stage. Um, it's very important to create positive outcomes between research and an affected community at the key uh, planning phase of the research. So I found that very useful. Uh, and then there was a co-designed uh, review before publication that I actually um, tried to do. Uh, so the sharing of knowledge was um, was done through a, a review that was um, actually available for them to have a look. So before any kind of publication that went through, I approached the village again, and I've shared um, those those uh, those results with them, and they were able to provide feedback. And so this was actually very good in. Um, building trust, but also keeping the connection alive with the communities um, and transparency about any kind of results that um, we had available to share. Uh, I think it's very important to keep that conversation going uh, through each step of the research process. And something that might be useful for researcher uh, would be to have some more guidelines that would be appropriate to um, Pacific communities or indigenous communities overall. Um, and um, so I found that this experience was uh, quite useful in understanding what kind of um, what kind of needs are emerging from the communities and what kinds of demands uh, emerge when you actually ask them the question of what would be beneficial for them um, when when discussing about returning knowledge. Um, so yeah, I hope um, I hope this was beneficial to this discussion, and I'm very happy to take on any other question. Thank you. Thank you, Delila. Um, I know that there's been quite a lot of work done uh, around uh, decolonizing uh, research methodologies, uh, particularly uh, around uh, Māori, and it's good to hear about uh, work around Pacific research methodologies as well. So that was uh, really uh, interesting. So now we've got the opportunity to ask some questions of the uh, panel. And um, the first question is one from uh, Dimity Flanagan. And she, uh, I'll throw it open to the whole panel, um, but uh, she's asking about um, 
publishing on Indigenous knowledge and uh, also the citation part of it? And do people who are operating in the uh, climate uh, research need to do more to lift the visibility of Indigenous knowledges and research in uh, the Pacific uh, by citing more? And uh, how can journals uh, encourage this? So if uh, Sully, Morgan, um, Dalila, your thoughts? Yes, maybe I can go first and then I'll let uh, Suli and uh, Dalila come provide their input as well to the question. Thank yeah, I think you. it's a very important question to uh, to pose here. Uh, it's not only about uh, publishing what uh, it needs to be published in terms of prejudice knowledge, but uh, as well as getting the citation required so that you know exactly how many, uh, you know, the impact of your uh, research out in the global community. And those two actually go along together. Um, and, uh, you know, what, what the trend I've observed so far is uh, quite a lot of open access uh, uh, journals and uh, publications are actually doing both while they are trying to, you know, encourage publications uh, at local level, especially focused on traditional knowledge, they are at the same time. Uh, also ensuring that uh, as many people uh, have access to those publications and for citation so that we can have maximum impact uh, from the knowledge that we share. And uh, that will be the approach, I think, will be for the foreseeable future to ensure that uh, we get into this uh, open access uh, publication uh, space and get those information uh, but please, but at the same time, get cited so that we can have the impact that we required as well. So that's my take on that particular uh, question. Well, thank you, Morgan. Um, uh, I think I'll talk from my uh, an ex the experience that I'm still an early career researcher. I graduated in 2020 from my PhD. Um, when I was doing my PhD, I realized that the work that I do as a researcher and how I defined impact really changed over time as well because of the need. Um, from then, um, I didn't really care a lot about publishing, but the impact of the research was to change communities in the Pacific. Um, my topic was broadly on customary land and how does that facilitate um, holistic kind of development for, for people because it had been like contested um, by researchers who are also academics and they were funded who stated, I will name them, uh, who stated that the very reason why Pacific communities are poor, because they own land customarily. They own land together in families. That's the main reason why they are poor and because of their culture. To, for more development in terms of economic development, we should remove all barriers around customary land. And then later on, we realized that those academics and researchers who were talking and writing and publishing about such sensitive stuffs for us as Pacific, uh, Pacific Islanders had been funded by mineral companies who wanted to extract minerals from different countries in the Pacific. Uh, for me, my research was that no, if we don't have land like if we can't own land in our for our families in the pacific, pacific it's a question of existence where would we live if we convert all the pacific island countries and their land into lot like you can own your land where your house is into residential blocks and you have a title for your land i don't think many of us will have a piece of land to live once we have 
blocks of land with land titles. The very next thing is like a, a pair of shirt that you buy from the shop. You'll have a price tag on it. And mm -hmm. only those people with money can buy land. So for us, it's a question of existence from then. So my research builds upon the need at that time so that we counter that kind of wall view that we have to be, to look at the world from a very Western perspective that you own your land and property alone. For us, land is not property. Land is more than a property. It's your family. It's where you bury your ancestors. It's where you bury the ancestors plus the umbilical cord of your children to make that connection and plant your totem tree to mark that cultural and spiritual connection. Selling your land is like selling your child. So from that perspective, my, the impact of research is very practical. But once I graduated and start to move on to, to uh, the academic world, it's about publishing. It's about receiving many citations. So the question, the moral question, shall I continue on the line of accent research and building that impact in a very practical sense? Or shall I start publishing into journals and articles, even though my people won't read it, but it's mm -hmm. about me having the citation. It's about me being recognized. And yeah. if, the, if there will be a platform that can facilitate both, that's icing on the cake. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, Dalila. Yes, thank you, Suli. I just wanted to add on that, that, um, that there is a huge gap there that Suli has uh, rightly uh, un highlighted. And um, I mean, when I'm trying to, to, to look back, um, when I first started doing my research, it was really, really hard to find, um, to find any kind of citation on, on, on really like um, uh, Pacific scholars that were um, working on the field, even though when I started digging, there, there is a lot, but it's just that the way the whole system is framed is made in a way that it's not accessible and we need to facilitate that. Um, I think there's a huge gap as well, um, and, and that's a result of, of this issue in the way we are framing climate, uh, climate change um, and the narratives are not really suitable uh, to, it's not really locally specific and suitable to uh, understanding of climate change uh, from a local community perspective. And, and for this to emerge, we need more presence um, from uh, Pacific scholars. Um, and and this, this, is, this needs to be facilitated. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you very much for that. Uh, you have uh, an audience that are made up of a lot of librarians. And this question's from Darby. Um, what can librarians and libraries do in the Pacific to uh, facilitate the research done, to provide and encourage access uh, to knowledge continuation? Um, yeah, I'll throw that open to the panel. Yes, thanks, uh, Chair. My take on that uh, particular uh, question is really, uh, you know, having the the collections in the libraries accessible to the general uh, public within the Pacific. You know, finding a way around. You know, how do we have the collections within our own libraries become accessible to the people who are doing research, but at the same time, people who need that information to do that and. Uh, the way I see it is through uh, schools, yeah? libraries, uh, making sure that uh, some of the journal articles or publications are, are, are put together by other publishers in a more simplified, uh, more diagrammatic and uh, novelistic ways so that uh, the children can develop an interest in them so that they can start reading about those uh, information that are contained in those uh, uh, collections in the, in the libraries. So that's uh, one area I think we can uh, improve on. But then I'll, I'll leave it to others in the panel to also provide their uh, take on this. Yeah, I think I th I thank you, Morgan, for the explanation. Um, I think um, um, Simon on the the chat here rightfully uh, listed some of the journal uh, mm -hmm. some of the journals which are facilitating. Uh, 
Pacific Island Research. Um, I think our center, the McMillan Brown Center for Pacific Studies, um, is hosting the uh, Pacific Dynamics. And um, uh, in many of our project meetings, we are trying to, to publish as much as we like, as much as we can to, to our channel of the Pacific uh, Dynamics. But on the other hand, there are other ways of, uh, you know, when we, uh, for any university, we always look north, right? In the Pacific, like universities, that's the trend. We, we look to, to the US, we look to Europe, but to look south, it's not really normal to look to the Pacific Island. It's not really normal. Um, but now that there's some changes in terms of climate because the Pacific Islands are living in the frontier of climate crisis, and then when researchers from and the voices of Pacific are now heard at the global level, like the IPCC, as well as researchers from the global north are coming to the Pacific. And then when the Pacific Island leaders started signing documents with the Chinese government, everybody focused to the Pacific. So I think there is a wave of changes coming through. Of, of looking at the Pacific, not as when there's something important happening in the Pacific. So, or shall we look to the Pacific in terms of publishing, in terms of sharing those knowledge, because they are part of us, the Pacific. I think there's a really huge role, but it is beyond the normal and it's thinking out of the box. Uh, the other perspective is that how do we share Pacific researches and how do not only in terms of publication, but in terms of notes, in terms of appearance on universities' websites and having that reach. Because when we, when we, you, I worked in a project, like my PhD was like for a project and then the project paid uh, for publications in numerous thousands of dollars. The reach is there. A lot of people will cite that book because of money being paid. But what can be done uh, to open access, which are not paid, but you know, your, you, you look at Google Scholar, open access, and your article has been sitting there lonely without any, nobody citing it from the past five years. <laughs> yeah, so there's huge issues, but you know, we, 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 there's, there's room uh, to progress from here. Thank you. Thank you, Sully. I think that's um, a really good uh, challenge for all of, all of us um, to leave uh, today's um, session on. Um, I know that uh, the next um, COPM27 is coming up uh, in Egypt. I'm sure we'll all be watching to see um, what happens in terms of what comes out of that and what it means for the Pacific. Uh, Ginny has just shared the Open Access Week uh, URL to sign up for other sessions. I want to thank the panel um, for your, um, your wonderful presentations, uh, your on-ground experience of what it's like uh, for uh, people in the Pacific Islands dealing with climate injustice, your plea and your call uh, for um, the academic and research community to lift up Indigenous voices and uh, to, um, to embrace open access and, uh, and for our publishers to consider their model and how they charge for uh, access to uh, publications uh, in the Pacific as well. So on that note, uh, thank you very much, Morgan, Sully, Dalila, for your time uh, today. And I hope that uh, the audience will join uh, the other sessions that we have for Open Access Week. Um, and on that note, I'd like to thank you all and uh, Matiwa, see you again. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you.